They say if you want to be number one, you got to train like you're number two. I'm just realizing I think I looked up the wrong kind of train quotes. First thing we're going to need to do is make ourselves some collections since I'm going to want to start modularly. I've divvied up the names as seating and door, but I mean you can call it whatever you want, it's a free country. We're going to start with creating the seating area, which is immediately followed up by me putting our first mesh into the wrong collection. Do as I say, not as I do, and put it in the correct one. I'm going to use a plane as the floor to start off and scale it up by two. Then I'll move it off the origin on the x-axis for when I want to array it later. I'm also going to add a person to help me keep things in proper scale, which you can access by enabling the Rigify add-on that comes with Blender. Next, we will need a base mesh for our walls. I'll just duplicate the floor, rotate it to stand tall, and push it over to the edge of the floor and reorient the verts. I'm going to want it to sit at about 4 meters wide and 2.5 meters tall. Next, we are going to get to cutting stamping out an area to place our window in this wall. I simply add a loop cut vertically and horizontally, and then I get to the beveling. Once I'm happy with the dimensions, I'm going to inset slightly to be used as a retaining loop, and then extrude our face outwards. Give it a slight scale inwards, and then separate the mesh, because now I'm going to make the frame. I'll inset this face, extrude it in, and pretty much redo the same process. The reason I'm separating them, however, is I want to add loops in different areas that I simply won't need on my wall or glass, so I wanted to keep them independent of each other. Now I'll add those loops, bridge my edge loops, and presto, we have a frame. With that completed, I'm going to go ahead and hypolify, that's a word, look it up, our assets. I'll add some more edge loops on the wall to create retainers, and then add the bevel and subsurf modifiers. Spoiler, we use them a lot. Change the bevel limit method to weight and the segments up to two to get that crisp look. I use it to tighten up the rim around the window and finally I'll add some loops on the edges to tighten up the sides of the wall. Now I'll link the modifiers from our wall onto our frame and repeat the same process, finding edges that I want to tighten up and lend some bevel weight to. Next up, let's take a look at creating dividers for these wall segments. A simple cube is enough to get us started, and I'll just squish it down and stick it in the corner. It's going to be the same height as our wall, so I'll stretch it back up, add some loops around the top, and then have them stick out just a little bit. Again, we're going to be adding the bevel subsurf combo for some tightened edges. However, this time, I'm going to want to keep the edges a little bit more rounded for some soft fall off. Something I didn't realize about starting this particular scene is just how bendy and round everything is in a subway cart. So we're going to get our money's worth with these modifiers. I'm also going to bring the divider into the 4x4 of the floor plane and use an array modifier to cast it across our tile. Our subway still isn't looking like much, but once we go and add the ceiling, it'll at least look like not much with a ceiling. Add another plane. Stretch it to fit the width of our tile and place the origin over the top right. Again, this will just help with arraying. Now that I have this up top, I'll go ahead and add some loops. In my research, I discovered that there was actually a universal law passed that required subway makers to develop the most goofy looking ceilings as possible. So let's follow suit. I had to bring my window down a little bit to accommodate how low these ceilings go because they could probably win a limbo contest. I've added a bevel along the bottom rung there to follow the curve of the pillars we've created, and it seems that a lot of a subway's design structure is oriented around having curves operate with each other in parallel direction. I'm also going to cut out and extrude what will be the aisle portion of the ceiling, and then round out the outward facing edge. Finally, I go ahead and add a light to our ceiling. I'll add some loops to define the boundaries of our light, some insets and extrusions later, and we've got ourselves a light. Now, when we go ahead and shade it smooth, it's gonna look like the pits. So to fix this without having to use a ton of extra subdivisions, I'm gonna set up an auto smooth to be used with a bevel and weighted normals modifier. This will let us bevel areas that we want to be tighter edges, and will simultaneously fix our normals shading issue. Once we add some bevel weights to a few of the edges, we're in the clear. 
The next asset we're going to make is comprised of several smaller parts, being the glass divider and handrails. I'll develop the base from a simple cube, pushing and pulling vertices where I think they should go using the bevel subsurf modifiers. I will finish it by creating an inset where we'll be able to place the glass sheet into. Next, we will get to creating that glass sheet. From humble beginnings as a cube, we crush, squish, and stretch the life out of it until it resembles something a little closer to our liking. I'll extrude some extra regions to run the pillars so that our glass doesn't intersect and has a cool little design to it. Then back to bevel weighting to make our glass nice and crisp. Next is our handrail. I prefer to use curves when making cylindrical assets such as this, and I went ahead and used a path to create the initial pattern, adding some depth to it via the curve panel. I'll also add a few more points along the curve to sharpen up some areas, and pretty easily we've got ourselves a great looking pole. From there, let's go ahead and connect our pole and glass. I'll scrunch down another cube, use our hard surface modifiers to get some proper shading on it, and then I'll duplicate it and move it to various positions along our pole and pillar. We're also going to need some chairs for our passengers to use. How disgusting they are is really entirely up to you. If photorealism is something that you're after, a good rule of thumb would be making them completely unusable. I'm just going to make a cube and have it hover off the ground for now. I also want to be able to array it exactly four times within our tile set, so sizing it appropriately will be important. Using our guy as reference, I'm going to push it snug to the wall. I'll add some loops to carve out the seat of the chair and reconfigure its dimensions. Again, adding modifiers to round things out a little. Not the prettiest chairs around, but when was the last time you saw a pretty chair on the tube? Quickly, I'll also add a base below these chairs to keep them propped up. Nothing more than a rectangular cube with a bend is what I used, but something straight would also suffice. Now I want to start developing the hanging bar and handles. The bar is pretty easy, again using a curve to establish the design. I'm going to leave the end open in case we want to array it, spoiler alert we do, to be able to merge with other bars. Just adding a slight bend inwards at the center and making sure that the ends line up at both sides. Since we use the curve for our bar, developing the handles to fit it will be a breeze. I'll start off the handle using a plane and arraying it four times with a little space in between. I'll then add a curve modifier to it and use our bar curve to be the object. Our curve modifier will need to be under the array to see it, but it will allow us to hang our handles from the bar without manually placing them. From there, I'll start creating the handle by hand, using a solidify modifier to add some dimension to it. I'll also go ahead and add a sphere mesh to the object as the clip and position it accordingly. Some final bevels and insets to introduce a pattern onto the mesh, and I'm calling it there. The final piece for the seating area will be a pole for the center aisle. This one isn't very much work and really only consists of an extruded circle from top to bottom. For our door piece, we aren't going to need to create a ton. Instead of a large floor mesh, I'll opt for a 2x2 two two plane. I'll also add an edge loop towards the outside because I'm going to use this for material editing later. The door is another plane, making sure that it is also 2.5 meters tall. I'm going to split it down the center and mirror it so that I only have to worry about creating one door. I'm also going to add a loop down near the bottom third of the door because I'm going to bring those vertices in to kind of round it out a little bit. I'll add a cut in at the left side of the door to be that cushion or padding that you can find on an automated door and extrude outwards. I also want a little bit of a gap between the doors so I'm going to just bring this over a little bit. I cut the door again this time to create the steel guard that you would find on doors and clean it up. Next, we're going to need some windows. This part is almost identical to how we accomplished it with the wall, by insetting a face, extruding outwards, and scaling it. I'm also going to separate the pieces in the off chance I decide that I want to add some loops, and I don't need them interfering with other parts of my meshes. I'll add the bevel and subserve modifiers to get the bevel weighting, and I'm also going to need some retainer loops to help keep this looking nice. Finally, for the door, we are going to need a ceiling. I'm simply going to steal it from our other piece and scale it down to fit. Now, I'll need to make sure that the light is not scaled down significantly, so I'll give that some extra attention. We can also see that perhaps the windows are a little too tall for the ceiling, so we'll have to bring those down as well. 
I'm going to go ahead and add an inset here just to add some variety to the design as well. And with that, I think it's safe to say that we're done the modeling portion. Now let's take a look at texturing this bad boy. If your material making skills are just as shoddy as mine, don't worry because there's places online that we can get some sweet, sweet free textures. Texture Haven is a great resource for PBR materials that are entirely CC0, meaning you can use them for any purpose, including commercial work, and they are entirely free. They also have HDRI Haven and 3D Model Haven, which are also great places for HDRIs and models respectively. I also managed to gather some awesome materials from CC0 Textures, another fantastic resource for quality materials of the CC0 or Creative Commons variety. First thing I want to do is set the mood. I'll swap over to Material Preview Mode and play around with the background until I get something dark. Then I'll go ahead and position an area light to act in as our light source, so we can have something illuminating our scene. I'll duplicate one over to our door, and we are ready to start with our materials. The first material I tackle is the floor. I found a pretty cool grungy material that fit the look. Using the Control T hotkey from the Node Wrangler add-on, I'll drop in an image texture hookup into our base color. I'll then add the roughness and normal maps as well, change them to non-color options, and plug them into the appropriate spots. For the normal, I need a normal map node. And for the roughness, I'm going to use a map range node rather than the traditional color ramp. The map range node gives you more control of the overall values, so I prefer to use it when I can. I want to make sure the surface isn't too glossy, although I'd rather lean towards glossy than too rough. I'll then set up the pillars and the wall the same way, using grayscale textures for roughness values and establishing a base color via the shader. This way I can change them easily to fit a different look if I wish. For the bottoms of these objects here, I want to go ahead and add the wall and floor materials to various parts of the mesh. To fix some of the stretching, I'm going to simply change the texture coordinate to generated and change the images from flat to box projection. That will help with the display of our texture across all our meshes. The chairs I made one solid yellow color using grayscale images for the roughness values. I went ahead and rotated it a bit to break up repetition slightly. And from there, I added a scratches image and mixed it with the roughness using the screen blending mode. This allowed me to add some scratches with control over intensity as well. I then used the scratches normal texture to add normal information to the surface, as slight as it is. Various parts of the train are simply just raw metal, and Blender makes it pretty easy to set those up. For the pole, I created a material and turned the metallic all the way up. That's half the battle right there. From there, it's all about doing what we have been and developing a convincing roughness value. I use some of the familiar roughness textures, playing around with the scale and offset of it using box projection. From there, I just went ahead and added the materials to all of the metal bits in the scene, and it really added some dimension to it. The next material that takes a little bit of setup is glass, particularly for its transparency. First thing I did was increase its transmission value all the way up, still not transparent. Then I had to navigate to the settings header in the actual materials panel, change the blend mode to alpha blend and shadow mode to alpha hashed, and then turn on screen space refraction. Still not transparent. I go over to the render properties tab and check on screen space reflections. Still not transparent. It's not until you also go in and turn on the refraction option that you'll be able to take advantage of proper refraction and transparency. It's a bit of a setup, but now we're there. From here, I want to decrease the value of the index of refraction to around 1.1 and bring down the roughness as well so that we're actually able to see clearly now. I then go about adding texture to alter the roughness at an irregular amount. And this is where a lot of realism is added for pretty much no effort. From there, I just added the rough material to the ceiling and went about making the lights emissive. They don't contribute much to the lighting of the scene but we need to make them emissive so that they're not obscured by shadow or other light. I also wanted to make the material incredibly glossy so that it could reflect the light, but that's totally up to you. The window frame and door padding got the same material because it's really just a nondescript black surface with varying roughness, all of which we already know how to do. I then set out to make the strap handles. I made the actual straps a similar color to the chairs with some grunge and roughness. The clips were a simple gray tone, which I left because nobody is going to look at them anyways. 
Now that we have most of the large materials done, I went about adding some accessories to the scene. On the bottom, I added a loop cut and assigned it to a new material I called Warning. I found a cool sign material and thought it would be awesome to place here. Initially, the face was a bit stretched, so I had to bring it down using an edge slide. There also should be a little more signage around the cart. So I made a plane and added this circular sign with transparency. This let me place the sign wherever I wanted and provided the option for shadows to be affected by the alpha mask. Now I bet you probably forgot, but I didn't. The floor over near the door had a little face on it that was going to allow us to place a new material. I just created a new material called Grip and assigned it to that face. I fiddled around with the location and the scale to get it fitting nicely, although you could have also unwrapped it just as easily. With a roughness and normal map, this looks pretty tight. Now, it's a well-known fact that CG cookie viewers are outright delinquents, so it's no question that this subway is going to need some vandalism. Made a quick tag in Affinity Photo, just some simple white text on a black background. I added a plane, plugged the texture into the alpha slot of the shader, and turned the blend mode to be alpha clip. Now, I just needed the perfect spot to lay claim to my tag, and I think the final touches are done. With our modular pieces done, I went ahead and mirrored everything over to the other side. From there, I went ahead and arrayed it too, so that our train could really continue on forever if we wanted. I went ahead and set up a camera, composed my shot, added some post-processing, and I baked the lighting using an irradiance volume object. All that's left are the renders, and I'd say we're done. So, that video was a little bit longer, but hopefully you learned a thing or two. Most of the work comes down to fine-tuning of materials and playing around with your lights, but you can make some pretty great stuff inside Blender. Make sure to subscribe to see more content just like this, as well as other great Blender learning resources. Make sure to head over to our community tab where you can vote on the next video. And as always, I've been Chunk. This has been Let's Build It in Blender. Later, skater. So this video was a shout out to all my trains out there for keeping me on tracks. So how does a train eat? Well, it chew chews its food. How, how else would it eat? So I was running to catch the train the other day, and as I got closer, I realized that my net actually wasn't going to be big enough.